All right, let's talk about the crystal field splitting of tetrahedral structures and square planar structures. Okay, so here we go. You may recall that the tetrahedral structure is a little bit less than half the value of the delta octahedral value. But that being said, the energy levels right here are labeled in terms of delta octahedral. So this is negative 0.267 delta octahedral. This is 0.178 delta octahedral. If you want to look at the uh, corresponding stability. And if you actually want to get the proper energy value, then you will just input the value of delta octahedral for um, the complex based on the identity of the ligands. So basically F times G ion. All right, so I'm going to give you um, a very hypothetical case. Let's take a look at chromium 2 plus. And let me add amine ligands. And not to say that this complex exists as drawn out. It's actually very hypothetical. But... We're going to do a calculation to see what happens with it. Okay, so chromium 2 plus has a delta octahedral value of 14,000 for the hexa aqua complex. Because we're dealing with the amine ligand, we're going to multiply the 14,000 by 1.25. But the idea right here is that if we're looking for delta tetrahedral, which is technically what we're after here since we're dealing with a tetrahedral complex, we add and multiply all of this by four nines, since delta tetrahedral equals four nines of delta octahedral. So four nines times 1.25 times 14,000 will give you a value of barely 7,778 inverse centimeters, which is way below the um, visible spectrum, right? So this wouldn't even give you a color if you actually had a complex like that. Okay, let's take a look at manganese four plus. Okay, so for manganese, 4 plus, having 4 ligands in the tetrahedral arrangement, um, you basically do the same thing. Multiply 4 nines times F times G ion to get the delta tetrahedral. And basically for um, manganese 4 plus, we have 23,000 inverse centimeters as the G ion energy. The F factor is 1.25 for ammonia. So multiplying all these values together, we get very close to that 13,000 cutoff. So this one may actually be close in the low, uh, low spin range, but you know it's you know short by a, a very small amount. So even with a high energy, excuse me, even with a high oxidation state and using technically what's considered as a strong field ligand, you still get um, um, you still get situations that are technically high spin. All right, so this is technically high spin, not low spin. Um, so the tetrahedral configurations, technically speaking, and generally speaking, are gonna give you these high spin situations. But be aware of those second and third row transition metals. They may actually make the difference and give you low spin tetrahedral complexes. Um, case in point, ruthenium, let's see, 28,600. If we use the amine ligand, and if we were to have a tetrahedral structure, which is not necessarily true, but if we were to have that, we will multiply the four nines by F times G ion. The G ion is 28,600 for ruthenium 3 plus. Uh, the F factor for amine is 1.25, and multiplying that by four nines gives us a value that is above 13,000. So for this second row, transition metal, you actually made a cutoff for a low spin complex. Okay, so the first row give you the high spin. Okay, now it's looking good. High spin, spin configurations. But the second and third row will most likely than not, regardless of whether you have the octahedral or tetrahedral complex, end up giving you the low spin configuration. Okay, that's very unique to that specific set of transition metal, you know, second row or third row. So just be aware of that. Okay, now square planar configurations. Uh, whether you, I ask you for the relative stabilization based on the numbers right here or not, uh, you could actually make some comparisons. So take a look at this. You could have a D8 configuration in which you have 80 electrons. And for the tetrahedral structure, I'm going with the high spin configuration. Um, although actually it doesn't really matter uh, whether it's high spin or low spin, you're going to end up with the same configuration, four on the bottom and four on top. If you apply the energy values, what you're going to find out is that the delta tetrahedral stabilization energy is negative 0.356 times delta octahedral. And if you apply the same thing to the square planar structure, we have eight electrons, you stop basically at 
the second to last energy level and the last one is completely empty um, if you multiply the negative 0.514 by the four electrons present in there the negative 4.28 by the two electrons present in that the 0.228 by the two electrons present in that you're going to find out that the stabilization energy of the square planar complex is negative 2.456 delta octahedral values compare that to the delta tetrahedral stabilization energy which is barely a measly 0.356 delta octahedral values it's almost a no a non-competition uh, what this is basically telling you is that the DA configuration is vastly favored by the square planar configuration and uh, in many cases that's what will dictate whether you have a square planar complex or not uh, now Technically speaking, for the first row transition metals, you still require to have strong field ligands bound to your complex in order to have the square planar configuration, specifically if the charge is 2 plus. But for your second row and third row transition elements, which favor the low spin configuration, they will favor the square planar uh, arrangement. Um, and so, um, just having the DA configuration doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have the square planar shape, um, although it's a good indication that you might. But if your transition metal is first row and the charge is low, 2 plus, for instance, you will probably end up with a tetrahedral structure instead of the square planar. All right, so this is basically the whole idea. But one more thing I'll tell you before I end it right here. The reason why for the first row transition metals um, that have a low charge that you might actually end up yielding the tetrahedral structure as opposed to the square planar when you have a DH configuration is because in the square planar configuration the ligands are 90 degrees apart from each other and the bonds are closer to each other as well. In a tetrahedral structure, you have a separation of 109.5 degrees, so they're farther away from each other. So, in the situation of the low charge cations of the first row transition elements, um, having the strong field ligands versus the weak field ligands um, is not enough to tell the story as to what the shape is going to be because you get a little bit of um, repulsion between the electrons of nearby ligands that ultimately affect the situation and in the tetrahedral structure they are farther away from each other compared to the square planar structure so basically at that point it's a question of sterics and how close together the ligands are to each other to determine the shape which is the reason why for the first row transition metals with a 2 plus charge if you have weak field ligands you're going to end up with a tetrahedral structure even if the configuration is d8 if you have strong field ligands then you will ensure the square planar configuration all right with all that being said um, i've told you everything i want to tell you for the transition metals at least for the purposes of this course um, hopefully you found it interesting and uh, with this information you can now finish the homework assignment so um, i'll see you in the next lecture video